Oh. Okay, great. So it's my pleasure then to introduce uh, Barb Coley, Community Programs Manager at Anderson Humane. And Barb, thanks so much for coming on today. And why don't you go ahead and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Carol. And thank you to ElderWorks for the invitation. Uh, I hope that I bring you uh, maybe a little different view of therapy animals and all that they can do for us and for those in need. Um, I am the community programs manager at Anderson. My job is to run community-based programs and therapy animals is one of them. Uh, and we also uh, run other programs that you can see on our website at ahconnects.org. But today we're going to talk about therapy animals, their benefits, all the different groups that can benefit, and uh, a few surprises. At least I know when I learned them, it was surprising how many different kinds of animals can be therapy animals. Um, I know most of us probably think of dogs, uh, but wait till you hear um, <laughs> what guinea pigs and dolphins and, and other animals can do for us. So uh, we'll begin. I thought we'd do a little bit of history. This was fun for me to, to look at. Um, this little doggy here, this is Smokey. Smokey is the, uh, according to Animal Planet anyway, Smokey was the first recorded therapy dog in 1944. And Smokey served in World War II, a Yorkshire Terrier, only weighed about four pounds and seven inches tall. Can you imagine this as a therapy animal? As I read more about Smokey, he was small and compact. He was courageous and he would accompany the men in the foxholes. Uh, he was very helpful at digging. His nose helped them also in their endeavors. Um, and then the Sigmund Freud uh, paragraph there above it, during the early 1930s, Sigmund Freud uh, became a proponent of this animal assisted therapy, AAT. It's called by many names, you'll see. But when he began using his favorite dog during psychotherapy sessions, he understood and began to see the chemistry and how he was able to bring people out of their shell. And then down below there, Boris Levinson, 1961. He accidentally used animals <laughs> in therapy with his children when he left his dog alone with a difficult child and upon returning found that the dog the child was talking to the dog isn't that wonderful um and of course florence nightingale all the way back to 1859 a small pet animal is often an excellent companion for the sick so i know when i think about animal therapy i guessed maybe it started in the 70s. Uh, and so this was a, a neat eye opener for me, uh, how very long ago we understood the power of animals. And so it begins. Uh, I just have to smile when I see this photo. This is Bubbles. Uh, you can probably guess, guess why uh, she was named Bubbles. Very bubbly. Um, she is one of our therapy dogs. Um, so just to have a definition, pet therapy is the use of animals when dealing with emotional, physical, and mental situations. When a person is under a great deal of personal stress, turning to a trusted pet helps lessen fears and provides support. So we're gonna take a look at some statistics about this form of therapy and get a better idea of its importance and uh, how much better life is uh, with an animal. Well, this is Domer. This is another one of our therapy dogs here. Uh, these kids um, are, I wanna say this was at Judson College or maybe ECC. 
during their uh, finals week. They had a room designated and it said stress free zone. And they asked us to bring some of our animals and uh, they got to come in there and relax after their finals. So let's do some of these fun facts. I hope you think they're fun and interesting. 88% of pet owners believe their animals help reduce stress. That's a no brainer. A recent study shows people with brain injuries become more aware during pet therapy. The CDC reports over half of the country's hospices now use pet therapy with their dying patients. That makes a lot of sense to me. My father lived uh, to the ripe old age of 94. He didn't know me at the end. Uh, he just called me pretty lady, which is wonderful. But when I would bring my dog in, he knew Snoopy's name, something just triggered within him and gave him uh, a lot of peace. 74% of pet owners claim that their mental health has improved thanks to animals, that from WebMD. And animal therapy greatly benefits children suffering from PTSD. When I think of PTSD, I think of military veterans. And of course, they do suffer uh, many times from that, from battle. Um, but this took me aback a little bit, remembering, of course, that children uh, who have been abused uh, or suffered trauma in their life, um, that animals could help them as well. Okay, there's Piper. Piper and Leslie, they went through our certification. We'll talk about that. Um, so he's posing for his picture with his certification. Uh, National Geographic says that the US is home to more than 50,000 therapy dogs. That's wonderful. Several types of animals can be used in pet therapy. American Counseling Association. Horses are the second most popular animal used in therapy. Dolphins <laughs> help fight depression, according to UCLA Health. And I've heard of people uh, swimming with the dolphins. I've never done it, but uh, I've, I've heard people talk about it and seen the pictures on Facebook. I just thought it was a fun thing to do. Um, but there are wonderful uh, other benefits as well. Guinea pigs. Guinea pigs are ideal pets for children with autism. That's interesting to me. I never owned a guinea pig, um, but maybe they're small size, they can hold it, look in their eyes, have the sensory uh, nature to the guinea pig. And even more, if I haven't uh, overloaded you already, um, 12 minutes of pet therapy has been found to improve important health markers in humans. These are the things like lowering of your blood pressure, um, slowing the heartbeat, um, and also certainly uh, emotional things as well, calmer thoughts, um, less panic, um, more solidity. Um, patients in animal pet therapy meet their rehab goals faster. That's cool. Um, I was telling Carol before we started that I raced here to do this presentation. I was at uh, our shelter and I was helping a disabled veteran. He comes every Tuesdays. You'll see a picture of him in a bit. Um, and we bring out uh, appropriate uh, <clears throat> dogs in this case to come out into the outside area, into the fenced in area. Uh, and they come out and um, Brett enjoys the, the dogs. They jump right on his wheelchair, lick his face, knock his hat off. Um, and he loves it. 
he always tells me it's the best day of the week, Tuesdays. Um, so I've seen certainly his progress. Dolphin therapy, there it is again, appears to be the most effective against depression more than medicine. Now, really, that's, a, that's amazing. Uh, veterans with service dogs display uh, fewer PTSD symptoms. Now you see that word service dog there. That's a very different kind of uh, dog than a therapy dog. Um, a service dog takes about three years to train. Uh, these are the dogs that can smell if their insulin is low, um, understand the PTSD triggers, um, can feel in some way that this person's going to be having a seizure. Um, this is a service dog, right? So you might see them in the store and it says on their vest, do not pet. They're worker, working dogs. Therapy dogs uh, really are just comfort dogs, dogs with a great temperament that um, can be in lots of different situations and not be phased. Uh, by anything. I just wanted to point out that difference. Uh, retrievers. Retrievers are the most popular service dog breed. So again, there's that word service. Very interesting all the ways that we can, can use uh, animals. So what makes a good therapy animal? Look at those faces. Um, let's get to that. Oh my goodness, um, I'm not quite sure what happened there, but before I talk about the places you'll go, let me talk to you about what makes a good um, therapy animal. Um, we do our evaluations every other month. Uh, we, are, uh, we partner with pet partners and we have a professional evaluator uh, that comes and does our evaluations. It isn't our staff, we're not certified to do that. But let me just say temperament, temperament, temperament. Um, it's actually a little bit more about temperament than obedience, but the dogs that pass and don't have to come back a second time are ones that have been through obedience training. Um, we want to be able to have I don't know, four or six people kind of rush the dog and pet them all over and see what the response is. And we do that because you can imagine when we bring an animal, let's say into an assisted living, that's exactly what happens, right? Everybody comes up, oh, you brought the dogs. And from the tail to the head, to the belly, to the back, to the ears, people are rubbing. Um, so we wanna see a dog that loves the attention uh, that isn't nervous, isn't fearful, um, and loves to be the center of attention. But we do want the dog to be able to sit uh, many times uh, down, right? Um, we want to see the owner and their pet walk on a loose lead, right? You're not yanking the dog, the dog's not pushing you forward you're a team. And so we wanna see that eye contact and that the dog is looking to the owner for cues of how to be. Um, one of the big no-nos is jumping, as you can imagine. Jumping up on a senior could very well knock him or her over. Uh, if you are in a school uh, or with younger children, uh, certainly that jumping up could, could do the same. So that is something that always needs to be uh, restrained and worked on. Some of our people that don't pass, we never say fail. Uh, those, do those teams that don't pass the first time is usually because of jumping. So we uh, let them know how to correct that. And it's all positive reinforcement um, and they get the treat when they do it, when they do it correctly, when they don't jump. Um, what else can I tell you about that? What makes a good therapy dog? Loud noises, although of course they're gonna react, we want them to recover quickly and not growl or show teeth or be so afraid, you know, the tail under their back end or cowering. 
And we do that in our certification by dropping a clipboard. Uh, happens to be a cement floor at the shelter. And so it makes, you know, it's surprising and it startles them, but we wanna see that quick recovery. And again, that's just because when they're in a new environment, there's gonna be new sounds and noises and we want them uh, to be able to just shrug that off. Um, I'm trying to think that I hit all the things. Uh, it's a 20 minute certification. It's uh, rather quick actually, but um, she runs through those uh, steps. And uh, usually after 20 years, she said, uh, she can tell just walking in the door how that team is gonna be. Um, now other certifications, not through pet partners, may have other sets of criteria, but those are some of the most important ones, I think, um, that, that we look for through pet partners. So where will you go? Dog is certified through wherever you have that done, connected to an organization like a shelter. Um, so I made a, a quick list here. Uh, we're trying to uh, think outside of the box. Um, you know, senior centers, assisted living, nursing homes, there are so many out there, you could only do that. And that would be a great service. Um, but uh, I've been looking into medical settings. Um, I'm talking about pediatric cancer patients. Uh, what about dialysis centers? You know, they sit there for so long on the machines. Uh, and I'm finding that there are many restrictions as you can imagine, right? Especially if the patient has a port, um, the dog sheds, those kind of things. Um, but I'm not giving up. I think that there are ways we can, can spread the love that way. Um, educational context. I've uh, shared a little bit about the universities. Um, we've also gone to high schools um, where uh, kids are doing a, a project on what you can be when you grow up, right? And uh, Streamwood High School invited us. Uh, these two girls, uh, they decided for their project, what would it be like um, to be a professional uh, trainer or handler with therapy dogs. And so that was kind of fun. We went into the high school. Uh, rehab centers, libraries, uh, that's sometimes surprising for people to learn. Uh, libraries can be wonderful places. You have all ages there. Um, many of the children's areas have um, programs that they do. I know in our area, it's called Read to Rover. And so our therapy dogs come in, they get loved up as they do. And then the children sit and read, you know, Dr. Seuss or something to the dog. It's just too cute. And it, it's still doing that therapeutic work, even in that setting. Um, after school programs, we have done a lot of that in some low income housing in our area. Um, and that is very, very rewarding. Um, camp, uh, there are lots of different camps out there, especially in the summer. And they're always looking to keep the kids busy. And so we, we have visited a, a few kids camps this year. Uh, there's our senior care environments. And um, we are trying to branch a little more into mental health programs, support groups. Maybe now that COVID is, I hope, a little more at bay, some of those group therapy and support groups are gonna begin uh, coming together again and we can bring our dogs there. Okay. You know how you do a PowerPoint and you make like three versions? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I uploaded one that wasn't exactly finished, but that's okay. If you don't mind, I, it's all in my head anyway. Um, I just wanted to uh, say a bit about Anderson, uh, not as a promotion, but just to give you the breadth of community programs using animals that perhaps you can start um, where you work or live. Um, our military veteran program, uh, there are MVPs, uh, Brett uh, today, 
who I uh, do every Tuesday. He's in that program. He is a volunteer. And by him coming into that fenced area every Tuesday uh, for only really about a half hour, he gets our kennel dogs outside, out of their kennel. He pets them and, and talks to them and gives them treats. And he helps us by socializing those dogs uh, to become ready to be adoptable. Our Healing Paws program, that's what I've really been talking about. This is our therapy uh, dog program. We have 48 volunteers uh, in the program currently. It's one of our most popular um, and constant companions. This is a program where seniors, or it could be the disabled, um, or low income seniors usually are no longer able to care for their pets. And I received many calls, uh, very tearful ones, saying, I guess I have to surrender my dog. I can't walk him anymore. And I know he needs that. And it's not fair to the dog. So we created a program where we have volunteers that come into the home, walk the dog, sift the litter box, uh, maybe even bring them food. Uh, if finances are tough, I know pet food is very expensive and the shelter does have an overrun of donations. Uh, so this has become a very popular program. It could be long-term or it could be just a senior for a couple of nights uh, in the hospital uh, and they wouldn't ever have the funds to board or family in the area. So we are uh, really trying to, to meet the needs of our community. Um, that is the end of my presentation. I am certainly open to questions, thoughts, um, any stories of your own. Uh, and I could talk on and on, Carol. There's, there's so many stories uh, about the ways that animals help folks. Absolutely. Well, uh, very interesting. And I love the constant companion. All of your programs, as I know, are excellent, but I love the constant companion uh, option for people because, of course, as you know, at ElderWorks, we work with seniors ongoing. And that's what we do is help seniors and families finding the most appropriate uh, care or needs or placement, whatever they need, we're the resource. Uh, and this is something that for us is beneficial and something that we can offer uh, because we get calls for almost anything you can imagine for people <laughs> for options. Um, do we have anyone joining us today that has questions uh, or would like to jump in and uh, give perhaps some additional information or talk with Barbara further about um, therapy animals and pets in general, questions you have, things we could help you with. Uh, I see you're all muted right now, but you certainly are welcome to unmute yourselves and uh, ask a question, no, no problem at all. Um, if you're, uh, oh good, I think maybe we have someone, uh, maybe not. So you could also put them in the chat box. Um, I have put my information in the chat box. If you need to contact me or have further questions on this, you can certainly call ElderWorks Direct, 847-462-0000. Uh, uh, or you can contact me direct. My information's in the chat box. Um, Barbara, why don't you uh, give them some information on uh, Anderson Humane and how they could contact Anderson Humane or yourself if needed? Absolutely, be happy to do that. I did click on chat and I do have a question if I could answer that first, Carol. Oh, sure, I didn't see that, sorry. That's all right. Hi, Elizabeth. She's asked, uh, when is the next assessment? And are you only having dogs or considering small animals? Um, the next assessment is October 4th. And I do have a slot or two still open. Uh, we do it every other month. So October 4th, and then the next time is December 6th. And then we start February and then every other month. No, it is not only dogs. We have two cats in the program. And I believe we are going to 
uh, evaluate a bunny <laughs> on October 4th. Now, don't, don't ask me. I don't think the bunny can sit, stay, or walk on a lead. I don't know. Uh, I leave that to uh, our evaluator. She's the professional. Uh, although I know for uh, the two cats that we have, um, they need to be able to be picked up, placed in laps, picked up, placed in laps again. Uh, some people have asked about mini pigs. Um, and so, yes, we are open to any and all animals. And I can certainly talk with you directly, uh, Elizabeth, if you would like. And to others uh, who are ha might have questions, um, our website is AH, as in Anderson Humane, ahconnects.org. And you can click on the programs and you can see much more information. Um, if you would like to call me, my phone number is 847-697-2800. My extension is 34. My name again is Barb Coley. It's spelled K-O-H-L-E-Y. And my email is B-K-O-H-L-E-Y at ahconnects.org. Well, thank you very much, uh, Barb, and thank you to all who participated today. And uh, we will have this on uh, YouTube or on Facebook as well. So we will look forward to hearing from you further. And we appreciate the fact that you joined us today. And we'll go ahead and close this session. And Barb, thank you very much for your time. Please, and, thank, uh, thank you, for Carol, me. for the opportunity. And thank you all for listening. Yes. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.